Uh, today I'm reading from Luke chapters 20, verse 13, Luke chapters 24, verse 27, and Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. Then the owner of the vineyard said, What should I do? I will send my beloved son, perhaps... Uh, then Luke uh, 24 says, hmm? yeah, 24, 27, yeah. Um, the beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted for them the things concerning himself and all the scriptures. And then Hebrews 1 through 4 reads, long ago God spoke to ancestors by the prophets at different times and in different ways. In these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, and God has appointed him heir of all things and made the universe through him. The son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact expression of his nature, sustaining all things by his powerful word after making purification for sins. He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, so he became superior to the angels, just as the name he inherited is more excellent than theirs. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Haddon. We will be in that last text that he read from Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1, and we're going to look there principally this morning, just to give us a bit of, um, we'll build us a foundation this morning uh, of understanding, if you will, and things in regards to the scripture. I have um, maybe, uh, uh, maybe presumptively uh, entitled this series, What the Bible is All About. How's that? He said, wow, why didn't we do this a long time ago? <laughs> then we'd know what the Bible is all about. But that's what we want to look at uh, beginning today. And we're going to use the letter to the Hebrews as a bit of a platform to give us something to work off of and, and to follow what the scriptures are telling us. Um, so before we go any further, thinking of those scriptures that have been read, let's just ask the Lord to help us in this time. Father, again, we bow our heads and hearts. We come to your word, your living word. And Father, there are things here that we, we want to get a hold of, and not just to get it in our heads, but Father, in our hearts. Help us to understand uh, this terrific love letter that you've sent us, not just the letter to the Hebrews, but the whole of the Word of God, that we would have a means of approaching it and understanding it and seeing how it works together. And Father, to see what the central theme of all scriptures is and to understand and, and be able to come to it again with, with um, adoration and, and, and worship, Father. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Two verses hadn't read for us from the Gospel of Luke. One is from a parable uh, that the Lord Jesus told, and one is from an incident in the life of the resurrected Lord Jesus, where he met two on the road to Emmaus. In the first one, he's telling the story of a landowner, right? We, you might remember, we've talked about this a little bit before, who had established a vineyard and it went away into a far country. And at the time of, of the harvest, he sent back his messengers to receive from his harvest. And the gardeners who were there, the administrators who were there, 
they wouldn't receive them, and they treated them terribly in so much that they stoned or even killed some of the ones that he sent back. Well, you can imagine the, the, the audience is listening with rapt attention to the Lord Jesus telling the story and thinking of these wicked gardeners. But that wasn't the end of it. The landowner says, as hadn't read, Then said the Lord of the vineyard, What shall I do? I'll send my beloved son. It may be they will reverence him when they see him. Mm. That set minds thinking. Then after the Lord Jesus is resurrected from the dead, two of his disciples are walking along from Jerusalem to Emmaus. We call it the road to Emmaus, right? They, they didn't ha even have a donkey to convey themselves. They're walking, trying to get home before dark. And this figure walks up with them. They don't recognize him. Uh, perhaps they're too overwhelmed with grief. Perhaps their eyes are just kind of glazed by, uh, by the Lord himself. But the figure that walks up says, what, what are you all talking about? You know, And they're like, where are you from? Do you not know what has happened? And they tell the story of how this one who came that they thought was going to be the savior of Israel was in turn rejected and, and the Romans had crucified him. And he says, don't you know how Christ to enter into his glory must first suffer these things. And then the verse that hadn't read for us, verse 27 of Luke 24 and beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he, the Lord Jesus, the risen Lord Jesus, expounded unto them all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. That, listen, I, I enjoy going to the Bible study at Tim's office, but that's the Bible study right there that I wish I could have sat in. When the Lord Jesus took the Old Testament and said, here, is where it's talking about me. And it's just about on every page. What is the Bible all about? That's a great question. And if you're uh, a, a new believer or are relatively, you, you have a Bible and you're like, well, there's this Old Testament part and a New Testament part and, and the Old Testament has a bunch of stories like, like, like David and Goliath and Noah and the Ark and Daniel and the lion's den and, and, and these stories that you've heard from Sunday school. And then the New Testament tells about Jesus and it has a bunch of letters that are written to different people, most of them by the Apostle Paul, but some others. And, and then there's Revelation, right? And that's just mind-blowing all by itself. I, how does it go together? How does that work? I mean, why is it this why are these brought together like this? How does this, I mean, is it just a collection of stories? We have the letter to the believers known as the Hebrews. They're Jewish believers. We don't know where the letter was written to. You know, all the letters Paul wrote, he wrote to Rome, he wrote to Colossae, he wrote to Galatia, he wrote to Philippi. This, uh, we know James wrote a general epistle to the Jewish believers, to Jewish, and this letter is like that. It's just a general circular letter to Jewish believers. Well, you say, well, I hadn't done the DNA test, but I don't think I'm Jewish. No, but this is a great place to turn to see how the Old Testament is fulfilled in the New. And so when you read, when we go through this little epistle and, and we follow along, we'll think, oh, that's what that meant in the Old Testament. That's why that happened. And here it's fulfilled in the New Testament. And so that's what I'd like to give us a foundation, 
right? To give us a place where we can say, now I understand how that all goes together. Now I mentioned that there's an Old Testament and a New Testament. You've seen in your Bible that it's divided that way. Why? What does that mean? What is a testament anyway? It's not a word we use very often. Not in our, except maybe in legalese. Well, it's a promise. It's a covenant. It's an agreement. It's, it's something by which two parties are, are agreed to participate in. Often, in this case, with the thought of an inheritance. So particularly in the Bible, there's, there's, there has to be the death of a testator for a, a covenant to be fulfilled, uh, this promise to be fulfilled. Uh, so it's like I have a will, right? But don't any of you sticky-fingered relatives come around until the owner of the will is passed, and then it goes to the heirs, right? So it's a, a promise that's based upon certain terms. And the old promise, the old covenant, the Old Testament, was based on an agreement, an agreement between God and his people Israel. We read about it back in Exodus chapter 19. We won't go there. But God said, I'm going to give you a few things to go by. And the people said, everything you say we'll do. He said, okay, well, there's ten rules. We call them the commandments. We see them in Exodus 20 and again over in Deuteronomy. And the, and the rule was, if you keep the law, you live. You have eternal life. You live with God. All you got to do is keep the law. There's only been one to ever do that. And they crucified him. That Old Testament, you say, well, that Old Testament must have been a failure. Well, it wasn't a failure on God's part. God would keep his part of the bargain. It was that the people that thought, I can earn God's favor, I can do enough good, I can keep things just right and be obedient in every way so God will owe me salvation. It would not work. But it was for a purpose. It did work in this respect. It showed people that they couldn't do it. They couldn't satisfy ten simple rules. They couldn't keep themselves pure before a holy God. Oh, what will we ever do? God said, I'm going to give you now a new covenant, a new promise, a new testament. And you know what? It doesn't depend on you keeping your part. There's only one who has to keep his part, and he does. And so the new promise, the new covenant, is the salvation we have in the Lord Jesus. He has done it all. We just say, I believe that. I'll take it. I'll take your free gift. That is it. And you say, well, what's the purpose of having two-thirds of my Bible be Old Testament then if it doesn't apply? Oh, man, it does. I've known some Christians over the years that would, might disagree with me. Well, I know they disagree with me. They don't even take all of the New Testament. They just take some of the epistles. They say, that's what really applies to us as a church. We don't, the rest of that we don't need. We need all of it. We need all of it. These things, the Apostle Paul himself would say, were written for our learning. And in fact, we see wonderful pictures of the Lord Jesus and learn about him even from out of the Old Testament. So that's why we have this whole Bible that you have in your lap or on your, on your phone or whatever means by which you're looking at it this morning. We need all of it 
Not all of it applies to me today. I don't worry about wearing linen and, and cotton together or eating shellfish or that sort of thing. Those things apply to the Jewish nation. We can, pe people confuse those things sometimes. But all of it is for us. So treasure this book that you have. So what the Bible is all about. Verse 1, Hebrews 1, God. That's where it starts. It all begins with God. This is an interesting way to start a letter. Now, Paul starts most of his letters, which this might be one by Paul. Matter of fact, the more I think on it and study it, I'm pretty sure it is. But we can't say for sure. Some of us can't. I know a few people that do. But I, I won't go beyond what the Scripture says. He would have started a letter with, to the saints at this place, or to the Christians at this place, to the elders and deacons at this place. This is all different. This starts like the Bible itself. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. And Hebrews 1.1 1, 1 starts with God. Now it's interesting, the author never questions, is there a God? They understood that there was. That God exists. And, and they would apply this, approach it from this perspective that there is an eternal existing God. And I will tell you, the Bible, which is always honest, always true, it never questions that there's many gods, little g, gods, that people worship. In fact, in the Old Testament, they rattle them off. There's there's Milcom of, the, of this group, and there's Chemosh, and there's, there's, uh, the one by, there's Baal, and there's Molech, whom they sacrifice babies to, etc., etc. It goes right down the list. And these different tribes said, well, this is our God, so we're going to pit our God against their God. The Philistines down on the coast had Dagon, right? And when they captured the Ark of the Covenant, they put it into the temple of Dagon like a trophy. We, you might remember Dagon was on his face. They had to help their God up because he fell and was found headless and handless in his own temple. There's many gods, little g, that people worship. You say, well, that's old-timey or that's in uh, backward cultures maybe uh, aboriginal type cultures around the world where people don't realize that the things we know from science. Really, you know there's 300 million gods in India. Is India a backward country? Who do you call for tech support? Right? Every town has their god as well as the big ones that they observe. The thing about it, the gods of antiquity are still with us. And I don't mean just in India or Africa or Australia or some backwater somewhere. I mean, they were all about pleasure or prosperity or prominence things that people make their God that they devote themselves to. Well, what happens? Well, I devote myself to my business and that's what I think of 24-7. And I'm going to knuckle down and work hard and prosper and that's going to be my goal. And maybe I do. Maybe. 
Maybe I excel. Maybe I get a little bit of the brass ring. Maybe I move forward or move up the corporate ladder or excel in my own business or whatever that case may be. Maybe I do that. We're, how much of that do I take with me into eternity? Maybe I strive to be known in the community or in some community. Maybe I run for office or then maybe go up a little higher the ladder or maybe I secure influence with this one or that one. Maybe I'm all about what satisfies human desire. I've looked for those things that bring joy or bring bring uh, satisfaction temporarily to the flesh. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we may die, right? And so I crave after those things. Whatever you might think of that people focus their attentions on, those are God's. And it's only sometimes when eternity looms before them that they realize that all those various gods, just like all those various gods found in the Old Testament of the Bible or found in aboriginal lands or found anywhere you find anywhere around the world, when eternity looms, you find those gods are deceivers. Every one. What a mistake that I devoted my life to this that won't go into eternity. Now what do I do? This God to whom the writer refers is the God who brought the worlds into being. And he'll touch on that. He'll work on that. But he wants to tell you that that same God has at various times and in, in a diverse ways spoke to us. The God that set the world into motion didn't say, okay, y'all have at it, let's see how you do. No. We find he's a God who loves his creation. We find he's, he's a God that's vitally interested in, in the, the mankind that he brought into being. And he's worked to communicate with them day after day in all sorts of ways, it says. Now, I, I was thinking about this. How do we communicate? How do you and I communicate? I thought, how do me and Kennedy communicate through the day? Now, maybe I send her a text message, or maybe it's a sticky note left on her desk, or may, maybe it's an email that I forward over, or sometimes it's good morning. We, we actually are at the office at the same time, and we communicate like that. So we communicate in a variety of different ways, just in the, just in the work of an office. And the different ways that we communicate uh, are for different reasons, right? We just don't do it all the same way all the time. We're in the age of communication, right? We can find somebody, message somebody around the world in an instant. It's incredible, almost scary, but it's, it's the world in which we live. This great God has likewise sought to communicate. Well, how did he do that? Well, first through creation, right? Paul would write to the Romans that the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made. Paul says, it's Romans 1.20, if you want to write that down, that God's eternal power and his, his Godhead is understood by what we can see. He's revealed himself in creation. 
more and more and more as we learn more and more about this, this world in which we live, there's that stamp of design in everything, everywhere. And it, it becomes more and more impossible for someone to say, this just happened. Lightning struck the primordial soup and somehow a living cell came alive. That's a Frankenstein story, right? Death, life doesn't come from death. The living doesn't come from the dead. There's a creator. There's a designer. God spoke by making the sun come up this morning. By the clouds that are in the heavens, by the flowers that are upon the rose bushes outside, God is speaking, if anyone listens. But then, of course, the writer says, he spoke to us, unto our fathers, he says. So it's not just God popped in right now, but throughout time past, up to the very day, he spoke to us through his prophets. Now, so, well, there's been a lot of people who have been prophets. There's a lot of religions that have their prophets. Hmm. How do we know which prophets are God's prophets? Well, God said it. God tells us. He said, I understand that you'd wonder about that. So here's how you know. If a prophet prophesies something and it doesn't happen, he's phony. We go through the Old Testament. Some prophets of God had a word from God that happened the next day that no one expected to see. Sometimes it might have been a few years. There are some that have yet to be fulfilled. But everyone has been fulfilled has been fulfilled according to God's promise. And he says, I confirm my word with these men and women who have spoke for me. I thought of one in particular with Elisha, I believe it was Elisha, and the, and the people in, the, in Damascus are starving. They've been starved out by their enemy, and, and people are, there's reports of people eating their children. They're so starved. The king sends to take the head of the prophet. It's, he can't get God, so he's going to kill the prophet. And so he sends his emissary to speak to the prophet, and the prophet says, here's what's going to happen. Tomorrow morning, you'll be able to, uh, tomorrow you'll have all the food that you want. And the guy says, if, if the windows of heaven open, I don't see that happening. And the prophet said, well, you'll, you'll see it, but you won't participate in it. And by the work of God, that those things exactly happened and that representative of the king was trampled to death by the people rushing to get to the food and preserve. He saw it. He didn't get, a, didn't get any of it. God's word was fulfilled. 24 hours. And people knew that, was, that man spoke for God. Because there was no way he could see it would happen. God confirmed his word. Well, that reminds us of our little parable that hadn't read because the Lord of the vineyard had sent his servants and just like the prophets people didn't really want to hear from God and so they stoned some and they killed some and so the God of heaven does this as we read in verse 2. God in these last days has spoken unto us by his son. By his son. What does it mean these last days? You're saying this was written in the first century and we are 20 centuries past that. It doesn't seem like those were the last days. He means 
that this is the consummation, this is the, this is the summing up of what has all happened in the past is coming to a point now where God is sending and has sent his son. God spoke in creation. God spoke through his prophets. God is now going to speak through the one that John called the word of God, the son. What is the Bible all about? Well, here's a clue. He sent his son. And he tells us a few things about him, and our time is rapidly going, so I'm going to go a little quicker. But I want to set this foundation for us. He tells us about this one who's the son. He identifies as the son, the writer does. He says, first of all, that he's appointed him heir of all things. He is, he is the heir of all things. Now, my dad was an only child, but you know when it came to inheritance, he had to split half of what he got from his mother with his stepfather. So even being the only child, he didn't get all the inheritance. But this son is appointed heir of all things. Everything that's the father's is the son. Hmm. There won't be any split off for anybody else anywhere. It's all his. It says, he's the one who made the worlds. Right? You say, wait a minute, I thought God made the worlds. Yes. There's God the Father, there's God the Son, there's God the Holy Spirit. The Word of God. How do we know the world came into being? What happened? And God said, let there be light. And God said. You read it over and over again in Genesis 1. John says, it's the word of God. God, the, the logos is the Greek word. It, it's God's expression comes through the Son. And so it is through him and by him that everything we see came into being. The, the, the writer wants us to get a clear understanding of the majesty of this person. And we do well to think about these things. It, this is jam-packed, man. It's jam-packed. Verse 3, who being the brightness of his glory. The Darby translation uses the effulgence. I mean, it's like, Let's make it harder to understand than it is. What does that mean, the brightness of his glory? If I look outside there, I see everything. Why? Because it's light out there. What does that tell me? It tells me the sun's shining. See, the sun reveals the Godhead. It reveals the Father because he's the brightness of his glory. He reveals well, everything we know about God we know because of the Son and through the Son, S-O-N. Well, maybe there's something else I need to know about God that, that the Lord Jesus didn't reveal. There's not. There's not. Everything you need to know is between the pages it's between the covers of this book in the words of the Lord Jesus. Anything else that you'll know, and there'll be an eternity to learn it, we'll, we'll know in heaven. Right. He's the brightness of his glory. He's the express image of his person. When the Lord Jesus walked on this earth, it was, he's, he's like the icon. He's like, this is the representative of heaven. Well, that Old Testament God, he was, he was rough, he was cruel. 
He, was, he seemed tough. He's different than the God in the New Testament. People say that. They're wrong. The God of the Old Testament was a God who expressly says, I look after the widow. I look after the orphan. I look after the humble. I look after the meek. I look after the, the poor and helpless. I, I'm the God who is not a respecter of persons. And the Lord Jesus demonstrated the heart of God by taking up the little children into his arms and blessing. Does that sound like a cruel, heartless God who's ready to smite you over the head? No. This is what God is like when we read of the Lord Jesus. He's the express image of his person, and he's upholding all things by the word of his power. We've touched on that in months past. The idea is, is, is it's not stationary. He's active. He's actively upholding things. He's actively, by his power, holding this whole world together that he spoke into being. And then it says, when he had by himself purged our sins. Now, I want you to think about this a minute. What does it mean to be saved? What does it mean to have my sins forgiven? How much of that did I contribute to? How much of that can I lay claim that God owes me for my part, turning over a new leaf, balancing uh, more good deeds than bad deeds. Zero. Zero. He did it by himself on the cross of Calvary. He laid down his life for your sins and mine that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but has everlasting life. He by himself. No one else could have done it, by the way. And, and we'll see that in the verses to follow. Only him. And when he was done, he sat down. You see at the end of the verse, he sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Well, it's three verses and we have five minutes. So there's ten more. Sorry about that. There are people that have icons or images of angels and they think they are to be perhaps prayed to or appealed to Angels are mighty beings, there's no question. They, they are, they're, if you go through the scripture, they're phenomenal beings. Thing, uh, there's things about them we can't get a hold of yet, or understand yet, won't until we're in heaven. If we met one today, if one were able to be seen by us today, I think we'd probably all be on our faces, just in terror. Verse 4 tells us he's better. Being made so much better than the angels, one, he has an inheritance they don't have. He has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. And then the writer goes through the Old Testament and pulls out these scriptures and shows how they apply to the angels and to the Lord Jesus. Verse 5, For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son? This day have I begotten thee. That's from Psalm 3. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. We see that 
pictured in first or second Samuel rather. And again, when he brings the first begotten into the world, he says, let all the angels of God worship him. That's from Psalm 97. He says in Psalm 94, who makes his angels spirits, his ministers a flame of fire, but under the sun, different, he says. Psalm 45, by the way, thy throne, O God. Wait a minute. God calls the sun God? He does, because he is. Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore, God, thy God, has anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. There's, there is an equivalency there. There's God the Father and there's God the Son. Psalm 102 is quoted in verse 10. Thou, Lord... In the beginning has laid the foundation of the earth. We've read about that already. The one who spoke the worlds into being. And the heavens are the works of thy hands. Creatorial power that spans the universe. And God by the Holy Spirit writing through in the Old Testament says, They'll perish. This universe, this whole, this world... The, and all that's about this whole universe will perish. But you'll remain. Thou remainest. They'll all wax old as does a garment. Listen, I still have clothes that wore for 10 or 15 years, but eventually they wear out or shrink. That's happened to a lot of them. But he says, you, you wear it long enough, it's going to wear out. But he says, like an old jacket or an old robe, verse 12, as a vesture, you'll fold them up and they'll be changed. But you are the same. And thy years shall not fail. That's a title, by the way. He's the same. He's the Lord, we read. He's God, we read. He's the Son. To which of the angels said he at any time, sit on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool? That's Psalm 110. He says, are they not all ministering servants sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? The Son I think chapter 1 here reveals us the Son of God. Chapter 2, when we get there, will tell us about the Son of Man. But I'll tell you this now, that the theme of all Scripture, going back from the old to the new, is the Son. And He's awesome. He's awesome in power. He's awesome in authority. I mean, how could anyone ever approach him? But we read he came with a pur purpose. And that was to purge our sins. How could we ever live without him? We can't. You need to know him. If you don't know him, you need to know him as your own Lord and Savior. And so that's the question this morning. Do you know him? You need to. You ought to. God is sending his message to you, the God who loves you. Will you hear it? Will you receive it? Father, we give you thanks for your word. The tremendous things we read here. Uh, Father, they just overwhelm our senses to think about. It's beyond our, our limited comprehension to imagine the majesty, not just of the God of heaven, but of the one whom you've sent to be the final word, your son. Father, help us in the, not just today, but in the weeks to come to appreciate him all the more. 
to understand more about him, to, to not only know him as Savior, but to know him as Lord, to know him as, as the one to whom we owe everything. Even as we sang, Lord, I give myself away. It is all that I can do. And Father, we do thank you for him. Help us to love him more and more as we learn more of him. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much for your patience this morning as we lay the foundation.